Hello and welcome to the Beef Edge, the Chagas Beef Podcast, for all your latest news, information and advice for Irish beef farmers. I'm Catherine Egan and on this episode, I'm joined by recently appointed Chagas Beef Enterprise Leader at Chagas Grange, Paul Crossan. Paul will feature as part of the panel on the Chagas Virtual Beef Week on the 10th of July on the grand challenges facing the beef sector. But first, I asked Paul, what has the first 100 days been like? Yeah, Catherine. Um, yeah, I was appointed earlier this year, uh, and it's I suppose you could say it's been a, an exciting period of time uh, for Chagask and and for the beef sector as well. I suppose if you look at from a Grange point of view, um, shortly after I came into the role, we had the royal visit of the the, the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge on the fourth of March. So, you know, uh, uh, I suppose starting with a bang, and it was a. Uh, you know, a, a, a very prestigious visit for us. Uh, it was a privilege and a pleasure for myself and, and Eddie O'Riordan to, to show the right couple around. So, you know, a, a, a very exciting start. And then I suppose shortly after that, we came into the, the period of COVID, if you like. Um, and that brought changes to all aspects of life. And certainly from a, from a Chagas and a Grange point of view, uh, the need then to develop, it, develop an operational plan, if you like, for the site. A plan for staff. I suppose the health and safety of staff obviously has to come first. Uh, we are an animal production site, so the the health and welfare of of animals and and the the, the cattle at at Grange uh, also had to be foremost uh, in our mind. And we're also, I suppose, uh, trying as best we could and in uh, as practical as was possible to maintain a research program. So, you know, the the period of COVID was uh, and still is uh, a challenge uh, and and something that we're all. Uh, addressing as as we go through our, our day-to-day activities and I suppose at the moment we're in the latter stages of the preparation for the Chagas Virtual Beef Week. Uh, I know you're you're very much involved in that yourself and you know it's another first for, for Chagas, another first for the for the beef program and um, we're learning all the time about technology, uh, about how to reach uh, our, our, our target audience uh, and the farming sector through, through all, all this new uh, media that's available to us so you know it's it's been a very exciting time uh, a time of great change uh, and hopefully over the coming weeks as we as we go through the virtual beef week uh, we look back and it as something that that has been very successful for us definitely the royal visit was something that a lot of farmers looked on in relation to the royals visit in chagas grange what was their impression of the beef enterprise at chagas grange yeah i mean the, i suppose the first thing to say is that they were very pleasant uh, and um very, very courteous, uh, and seemed genuinely interested in uh, in animal production, and I suppose in the in the nature of the relationship, if you like, between animal animal production and animal production systems and food production systems and the consumer. Uh, you know, just that gap that seems to have arisen in, in recent times between, uh, you know, the, the the urban consumer, if you like. Uh, and how food is produced, uh, and we're interested in, in in all aspects of that. Also, in relation to um, the environmental sustainability of our food system, which is obviously very closely tied in uh, with that gap between consumers uh, and food production. So, I suppose the the general question being, uh, is the is the general person on the street that goes into a, a retail uh, outlet and, and purchases a, a piece of meat or whatever it might be, are they aware of of how it is produced are they aware of the other functions that cattle production provides uh, to the countryside so you know I, I felt they were genuinely interested and knowledgeable about uh, about the challenges the food sector faces and the challenges of communicating to the consumer most definitely can you give the listeners an outline of the research programs currently underway at Chagas Grange yeah I suppose firstly uh, for the listeners uh, it probably useful maybe to give an outline of, of Grange itself we're uh, a 600 acre farm uh, of permanent grassland in County Mead. Uh, we have accommodation for over a thousand, about 1200 cattle, uh, and we can individually feed uh, about 350 cattle. So that allows us to carry out detailed experimentation on animal production systems, looking at uh, individual intake and, and animal performance levels. Uh, obviously, to, to support that, we have a suite of laboratory functions uh, ranging from you know, feed and animal physiology to parasitology to molecular labs uh, and uh, the research services and, and support staff to, to manage all of this. Uh, so, you know, we have a, a quite a, a, an extensive array of, of services and, and uh, research facilities available to us. Uh, in terms of the research program, I suppose we, we essentially operate a program from cradle to grave, if you like. Uh, so looking at breeding and indeed pre-breeding, 
uh, right through to, to neonatal health and performance, uh, through to calfhood, uh, looking at calf health, um, maternal uh, production, if you like, milk production and fertility of the, of the suckler cow, uh, through to grass and management and forage production, through the lifetime of the animal, uh, and right through to uh, finishing systems uh, and slaughter traits. And all along the way, carrying out a suite of measurements uh, in, in respect of, you know, digestibility, uh, uh, looking at environmental performance of animal systems, uh, and looking at meat quality traits of, of the beef that's produced. Breeding is at the forefront of a lot of farmers' minds at the moment. What is the current research programme at Grange in relation to breeding? Yeah, absolutely. I think you're, you're, you're 100% right, Catherine, in terms of, of the, the, the focus on breeding uh, in the foremost of, of many farmers' minds. Uh, and if we look at the sort of national statistics in terms of, of reproductive performance, we probably have a gap to make up there. So I suppose a lot of our research from a reproductive performance point of view is looking at reducing the age at first calving in the national herd. Uh, focusing on homebred replacements, uh, reducing calving interval. Um, we, we operate a seasonal calving and a seasonal production system in this country, uh, trying to maximise performance from grazed grass. So, you know, calving compactly in spring confers an enormous advantage in that production system, allowing, you know, calves to be born early uh, and to achieve a long grazing season. So uh, reducing calving interval and, uh, you know, allowing that grazing season is, is critically important. Uh, also, from a reproductive efficiency point of view, uh, and indeed a genetic improvement point of view, increasing the use of AI and, you know, looking at, at issues around labour and, and cost effective management uh, around AI uh, is, is a focus as well. So trying to, trying to increase the genetic progress in the herd, trying to Im improve reproductive management and reproductive performance and doing so in a, in a cost effective and labour efficient manner is, is, an, is a substantial focus of the programme at the moment. Two of the most recognised research projects in Chagas Grange are the Dairy Calf to Beef and the Dairy Patrick Research Experiments. In recent podcasts, I've spoken to both Nikki Byrne and Michael McManus about their experiments. Can you give an update on what's happening on the farms at the moment? Yeah, uh, and Michael and Nikki will have, have provided the detail, I suppose, and they're, they're the people that are closest to the, to the experiments. Uh, I suppose from a Dairy Patrick point of view, um, we calved down 105 cows this spring uh, and the outcome was 110 calves. So we were very, very happy with that level of performance. Um, from an age at first calving point of view, uh, average age at first calving was, was almost bang on 24 months. So I think 24 months and, and two or three days. Uh, so again, uh, hitting the targets exactly where we would like to be. Uh, and our calving occurred over an 11 week period. Again, a compact spring calving. Uh, we had six, uh, we had 85% calved in six weeks. Uh, and 95% calved in nine weeks, uh, and all from 100% AI. So, look, we're very, very satisfied with the performance. Of course, we have, uh, you know, we 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 have we have good facilities, uh, and we have uh, good support around the herd, uh, and all of that allows us to uh, to 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 meet those uh, great performance levels. Uh, but of course, as a proof of concept, it's showing that with an with an AI system, uh, and with a, a late maturing herd, uh, that those performance targets are achievable. Uh, breeding began on the 4th of May this year, um, and in the first three weeks, we had 100% uh, of our heifers bred, uh, and over 90% of the cows were bred. Uh, so again, looking good for a, a tight, compact early calving season again next year. Uh, and we would typically aim to have a, a mean calving date uh, in and around the 10th or 11th of, of March. That's a good match for us at Grange to uh, match our, our calving and turnout with the availability of grass and the start of the grass growing season. So yeah, again, breeding going very well so far uh, this year. Um, live weight gain, I suppose steers doing very well, uh, have, have achieved about 1.25 since turnout uh, and heifers about 1.15. So doing very well at grass this year. Uh, on the dairy calf, the beef system, as, as you mentioned, Catherine, uh, Nikki Bourne has covered that in a previous uh, podcast. Uh, I, won't, I won't go into the detail of it, but just to say that again, uh, from a live weight point of view, we're, we're very satisfied with the performance there. Uh, calves are now all at grass, uh, doing about 0.7 kilos a day uh, since, uh, indeed, since arrival. Uh, they'll be doing much, uh, even better than that at the moment. Uh, 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 they're growing well uh, on grass only diet. Um, and yearlings, again, uh, turned out around mid March and doing about 1.4 kilos a day since turnout. So 
So we're very satisfied with performance uh, across the board uh, on our research experiments. I suppose, you know, just to maybe make the point that like much of the rest uh, of certainly the east of the country, uh, soil moisture deficits was a, were a problem uh, in probably early to mid June, um, you know, and we had probably a week to 10 days of, of silage supplementation to some groups of animals on those ex uh, experimental herds uh, to allow, uh, to, to mitigate for the poor uh, grass growth at that time. Uh, we have had sufficient rain. Uh, indeed, if it stopped now for a few days, it'd be great. Uh, so we've ha we, we have had rain and the grass growths have, have resumed uh, at their expected levels. So um, yeah, that grass supplementation or grass silage supplementation has, uh, has ceased uh, and we're now on a grass only diet again. It's great to hear that breeding season has been going so well. Are you confident that farmers are going to benefit from research being carried out at Chagas Grange? Yeah, I suppose um, we, we, we should look, I suppose, at, at where we think levels of performance can be improved in the national herd, maybe to answer that one. Uh, and if we look at, you know, for example, calving interval, uh, the national average calving interval is about 394 days. Uh, and in a seasonal calving system, we want our cow coming back around every uh, every year. Uh, and, you know, if you look at that figure, we're losing about a month uh, in terms of the average calving interval. So I think research around reproductive efficiency to shorten those calving intervals is 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 essential. Uh, and we have research looking at shortening that anestrous period, that period uh, where the cow is, is non-reproductive uh, post-calving. Uh, also, if we look at the, the six-week calving rate, we probably have an industry figure of around 50%. Dairy Patrick's about 85%, uh, and our, our target would be around 80%. So again, looking at that in the Easter period and trying to, to tighten and have more compact calving. Calving at two years of age, uh, we would like all our heifers calving at two, year, two years of age. Uh, we know that the, the suckler system, from an economic margin point of view, is, is, is very tight. Uh, so, you know, that loss of six months in, 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 in productivity uh, and that additional six months of feeding is an economic overhead and indeed it's an environmental overhead from a greenhouse gas emissions point of view. So our research around, you know, reproductive efficiency uh, is essential to try and address those. Equally, if we look at the other elements of the program around live weight performance uh, and animal health, uh, all tied in with that, um, you know, we're, we're our average slaughter age of steers in and around 28 months um, at 395 kilo carcass. Looking again at the, the targets and what's been achieved in the Derry Patrick herd, we're slaughtering in and around 22 months with, with the same carcass weight. So there's about six month uh, delay in slaughter uh, with no advantage in slaughter weight if we look at the industry figures. So the, I suppose the, the, the research around animal health and indeed, the general animal, uh, general animal husbandry, and and linking in with our extension program to try and to try and uh, um, if you like provide that information to our farming audience is is absolutely essential. Stepping back a bit and looking at the beef sector more broadly, what do you see as the grand challenges facing the sector, and how will the research programs evolve to address these challenges? If we look at uh, the the number one challenge of the sector, it is and has been for some time lack of profitability. You know, we, we can look at any of the statistics, the National Farm Service, CSO, uh, farm income statistics, all of them showing that from their cattle activities, if you remove um, if you remove the direct support payments that farmers receive from their cattle activities, on average, uh, beef cattle systems are losing money. So there's no question that profitability is the number one challenge. And all of those issues that we refer to around, uh, you know, around improving productivity and reproductive performance, live with performance, uh, improving animal health, improving feed efficiency, uh, all of those issues absolutely essential to address the lack of profitability. <clears throat> we also have to look at, I suppose, a second challenge around the whole issue of societal expectations of sustainable food production systems. You know, and, and, and you know, I suppose we see it in, in policy documents, we see it in the, in the media and the general public narrative, carbon efficiency and carbon footprint, animal welfare standards, antimicrobial usage, you know, the whole area of land usage, are we efficient uh, in our use of land? Uh, and indeed, uh, are we supporting uh, biodiversity and biodiverse uh, flora and fauna in our countryside? And all of those metrics becoming increasingly important. Uh, in terms of our research program, I suppose if you look at the traditional research program, uh, it was around trying to improve the productivity of animal performance, animal pr production systems. 
So that's uh, improving, you know, live weight gain, improving meat quality attributes and so on. I suppose in more latter years, we looked at, you know, the environmental impact of some of those uh, management systems. So describing those systems from an environmental perspective uh, while we were conducting the, the productive research experiments. And I suppose uh, going forward now, there'll be an increasing emphasis on environmental outcomes from our production systems. So looking at various methods of production and what effect that has on environmental outcomes and maybe the production uh, research or the production uh, outcomes will be uh, almost the descriptive part of the research. So if we can achieve our environmental outcomes, can we also have uh, a measure of improving productivity as part of that? Obviously, you mentioned there the common agricultural policy will be very important and currently discussions are ongoing and there are indications of greater restrictions in relation to fertilizer, chemical sprays and antimicrobial usage, as you've mentioned. To what extent will this shape the beef production systems in the future? Yeah, I mean, we, we, we certainly uh, can see again from the farm income statistics the importance of the, the common agricultural policy. Uh, absolutely essential that, you know, whatever policy changes come into being that our, our beef systems are compatible with that. And indeed, uh, our beef systems are in a position to maximise uh, the drawdown of payments from the common agricultural policy. Uh, if we look at some of the, the, the headline issues, you know, reduction in fertiliser usage, uh, reduction in the use of antimicrobials uh, and and reduction in the use of chemical chemical sprays. Um, so if we look at that, I suppose firstly looking at fertilizer usage, uh, we have relatively low usage of of chemical nitrogen on our on our beef systems relative to other other uh, production systems in Ireland. Uh, but can we reduce that further? I mean, we have technologies to uh, to have zero end systems. If we look at multi species grassland or clover based wards. Uh, they all they all reduce very considerably our requirement for chemical fertilizers. Uh, probably the cost of implementation of those, the, the actual systems themselves are low cost, but the cost of implementation, the cost of training and upskilling, uh, were all challenges. But as they become more tied into uh, policy payments, uh, then maybe the the value of those and the cost of 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 upskilling uh, becomes becomes uh, more, more economical from a farmer perspective. Uh, looking at the whole area of antimicrobial usage, um, you know, the whole area of vaccine development, you know, can we develop, for example, some of our um, uh, antimintic uh, usage? Can we reduce the requirement for antimintics by the development of vaccines for the likes of, of liver fluke and so on? Uh, can we improve diagnostics so that we have more targeted use uh, of antimintics? And I suppose in general, can we improve husbandry practices uh, so that, you know, antimintics and general antimicrobial usage uh, is less required? You know, that might be, a, a, you know, looking at breeding uh, for more resistant animals. Uh, and it, it might be issues around, uh, again, husbandry uh, and, and management practices that reduce the requirement for antimicrobials. Uh, and I suppose uh, in, a, in, a, in a broader sense, uh, we're probably looking at more results-based eco-schemes, you know, so that, that schemes that will pay farmers and reward farmers on the delivery of certain outcomes that the, the European Commission and indeed the consumer requires. Uh, and so then the question will be, how does this align with productive beef systems or how can we align uh, our beef systems to remain productive and improve productivity uh, at the same time as deliver, deliver these outcomes required uh, of the consumer uh, and of EU policy? No doubt there are a number of challenges. On Friday the 10th of July, as part of the Chagas Virtual Beef Week, you're featuring on the panel titled Grand Challenges Facing the Beef Sector. What can farmers expect to see on the day? Yeah, on, on Friday the 10th of July, we, we have a day focusing on these grand challenges. So uh, in the morning, uh, the, the Beef Talk webinar will focus on economics of beef systems. And, you know, we were very clear that the number one challenge is profitability and, and farm incomes. So the morning webinar will, will focus primarily on that economic challenge, I suppose, outlining the state of play and may, maybe trying to drill down into to some, of the, some of the factors that drive profitability uh, and performance on, on beef cattle farms. Uh, then that afternoon, we have a, a panel of industry stakeholders. Uh, we have Mairead McGuinness, MEP, uh, Tim, Cal Tim Cullinan, uh, President of the IFA. Uh, we have uh, Director of Chagas, Jerry Boyle, uh, and we have the Minister for Agriculture who will um, outline, I suppose, their view and their vision uh, around uh, those grand challenges and how we can address them in the context of policy change, 
uh, in the context of evolving consumer demands. Uh, and that session, that live at Grange session on Friday the 10th of July, uh, will be facilitated by Professor Thea Hennessy from University College Cork. So we're really looking forward to that. I think it'll be a really interesting discussion uh, and, and hopefully will prompt wider discussion among the beef community. It sounds like a great lineup, Paul. Looking forward to seeing more on Friday the 10th of July. Thanks very much for joining me on the show. Thank you, Catherine. That's all for this week's episode. And my thanks to Paul for joining me on the show. Chagas will hold a virtual Beef Week from Monday the 6th to Friday the 10th of July. For further details, keep an eye on our Chagas website, Facebook and Twitter pages. You can catch up on all other shows and interviews from the Beef Edge podcast on the Chagas website at chagas.ie. Or you can listen on Apple and Google Podcasts as well as Spotify. Don't forget to rate, review and subscribe so you never miss a show. For all other updates from our Beef programme, keep an eye on our Twitter and Facebook pages. Until next time, I'm Catherine Egan and thanks for listening.